Uh, good morning. Following the private session in which members considered uh, its work programme, I now move the meeting into public and welcome you to the 16th meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External <coughs> Affairs Committee in 2017. Uh, I'd like to remind members and the public to switch off their mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers during the meeting should ensure that they're switched to silent. Apologies have been received from Jackson Carlaw and I welcome Margaret Mitchell as a substitute. Welcome, Margaret. Our second item of business today is a decision on taking item four in private. Are members content? Yeah. Our third item of business today, we will take evidence on the Scottish Government's international development strategy and we have a range of stakeholders who have come to give evidence to us uh, today and I would like to start by inviting our, our witnesses and uh, members of the committee uh, to introduce themselves. Uh, I'll start. My name is Joan McAlpine. I'm the convener of the committee and MSP for South Scotland. Lewis MacDonald, North East Scotland, Deputy Convener of the Committee and also a Convener of the Cross Party Group on International Development. Mary Evans, I'm the MSP for Angus North and Mearns. Richard Lockhead, MSP for Murray. Stuart McMillan, MSP for Greenock and Inverclyde. Ross Greer, MSP for the West of Scotland. Margaret Mitchell, MSP Central Scotland. Jane Salmonson, I'm the Chief Executive of NIDOS, it's a uh, the network of international development organisations in Scotland. David Hope Jones, Chief Executive of the Scotland Malawi Partnership. We represent around 1,200 different organisations and individuals that have civic links with Malawi. Um, my name is Hazel Gray, I'm a lecturer from the Centre of African Studies and I'm also a member of the Global Development Academy at the University. I'm Tanya Wisely, I'm the Coordinator of Ideas. Um, which is a third sector network um, of organisations that uh, support, develop and deliver global citizenship education in Scotland. Um, uh, can I just say as well, I consulted with the committee clerks because I was also elected as a councillor in the May elections and they just suggested that I make you aware of that, but that I'm not here in that capacity. I'm here for ideas. My name is Geraldine Hill. I'm the advocacy manager at SCIAF, which is the Scottish Catholic International Aid Fund. Um, I am Hina Kamar. I am the Charity Development Manager for First Aid Africa, which is a grassroots international organisation that uh, brings partnerships of um, together first aiders in East Africa and Scotland. Hi, I'm Jo Sharp. I'm um, a Professor of Geography at the University of Glasgow and I'm here to represent the Glasgow Centre for International Development, which is an interdisciplinary research grouping across the university. Uh, thank you very much. I think perhaps we could start with um, maybe perhaps a, a general uh, question on what you see as the main challenges are uh, for uh, the, your sector uh, in Scotland and perhaps respond to the refreshed uh, Scottish Government international development strategy which, I be, which was um, unveiled uh, last year in December. Uh, who would like to begin? I shall begin. When I joined uh, NIDOS last year, we took part in a major strategic planning exercise, which involved going around to speak to members of the organisation all the way around Scotland. So the voice of the membership came across in what were people's main uh, uh, fears, challenges, aspirations, hopes, goals, and so on and so forth. Uh, the main challenges uh, involve particularly uh, concerns over funding, uh, how they will manage to get funding for their work, as more and more sources of institutional funding appear to be shrinking, and with fears over whether uh, uh, Brexit and other elements were going to have a squeeze on consumer spending, therefore uh, individual donations. So a concern about where the money was going to fund, come from to fund their work. Uh, to have a look at the international development strategy in that light, uh, whilst uh, 10 million from the International Development Fund is obviously not a huge amount of money, uh, that source of funding being secured and furthermore increased, and the, if you like, the uh, moral endorsement 
and encouragement given to the sector in Scotland is really very warmly welcomed. So the production of the new strategy, not just a little bit of extra funding, but the encouragement from the sector came at a time, I think, which uh, uh, was very well received by the international development community in Scotland. Thank you. David. Um, maybe if I may, three headline points that I'm sure we as a panel will drill down further into later on. Um, challenges and opportunities. I guess the first obvious one for me is the sustainable development goals, um, that this is a real um, challenge and an opportunity for Scotland and the 191 other countries that have signed up to these goals, both in the international work and the domestic work. And I hope we have the chance this morning to, to talk about the goals. I think there is a challenge in Scotland and across the UK in the media. I think there's certain sections of the media that uh, are never one to miss an opportunity to do down international development and international cooperation. And there is a role for civic society, as well as the government, the parliament and business, to be promoting the many, many good news stories that are out there and the clear impact that that work is having. And I guess the third point for me is, the constructive synergy that exists between government, civic society, parliament, business and academia. And I think that's been the great uh, strength of Scotland's approach to international development, that there has been close collaborations and synergies between government and, and civic society. And I think this very strong uh, new policy sets out a clear framework of how that synergy can continue. So three points from me, um, SDGs, uh, the media and the synergy between government and civic society. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, I think that in, for uh, the Centre of African Studies and the Global Development Academy at the University of Edinburgh, obviously um, in engaging with international development, our biggest concern at the moment is the implications of Brexit uh, for students and research. But it's also a very exciting time for us because there's such a thirst to understand international development from our student body. So we've got a lot of interest uh, in development courses and across um, all of our uh, teaching areas in issues related to international development and our student body is an incredibly outward-looking uh, group of students. Um, our challenges are also very much around building ethical partnerships with uh, organizations and institutions in the countries where we are researching. That's at the core of our objective. So we are trying to develop um, strategies around how to build capacities and capabilities and develop uh, common uh, goal setting and strategies around uh, priorities of uh, research. Um, another big challenge that we have is around uh, monitoring um, and um, impact and how we um, assess uh, the validity of um, the programs that we are trying to support and uh, draw from all of the disciplinary expertise that we have across the university. Um, and all of these things chime very much with the new strategy, and it's particularly around um, the role of expertise and what that means, what our long relationship as um, an African Studies Centre that was established in 1952 and is the biggest in Europe, what we can do to uh, help to um, bring expertise together on uh, Africa uh, and more broadly on developing countries through the GDA. Um, but also because our research is very much based on collaborations both within Scotland, across universities and uh, different types of organisation, and also across uh, countries where we research, um, we are really delighted to see the strategy is focusing on these kind of aspects as well. Um, I think uh, first probably to say our, our work with global citizenship education obviously spans the international development um, side and the education side, so it's really the international development side that I'm talking about here. And I think the key thing for us is the need to uh, continue to build um, and develop pub public engagement and understanding uh, with international development. Um, obviously the issues involved are very complex and dynamic. Um, so, in, in our view, this, this needs to be underpinned by processes of education, by global citizenship education, which is a well-established um, participative way of in, engaging people rather than um, simply informing people about international development. Um, in terms of this strategy, I think the key uh, frameworks for um, developing this public understanding are um, certainly the, the sustainable development goals, um, but also policy coherence for development, which um, 
has seen, I think all of us here would agree, is, is, is crucial to taking forward this, this agenda in a, a constructive um, and in innovative way. Um, the other two points are uh, we also have a, a strong uh, European Union uh, context for our work, which are flagged up in the written evidence, um, and also uh, issues around build, building the evidence of uh, the impact of global citizenship education, which is an important part of our work as well. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, I would echo some of what my colleagues have said. Um, I think as SCIAF, we have been really delighted to see the ongoing commitment, both in the government and, and in the parliament, to international development, the commitments to the fund, the Climate Justice Fund, the Humanitarian Emergency Fund. We think, given the challenges faced in climate today, it's really good to see the separate fund on, on climate justice. We really welcome that. Um, We've been really glad to see the focus down in the strategy. We think focusing in on limited countries and geographical areas is the way to go. Um, we also think focusing down thematically is the way to go and making sure that um, what's done in DFID isn't replicated and duplicated. Um, but I can, what my colleagues have said, I think David mentioned the challenges with the media. We see that as well. I think we're not quite as bad up here, but it's definitely an ongoing challenge about general perceptions on international development. I think I echo again what uh, Tanya was saying about policy coherence for development. I think it's really important that there's a whole of government approach to this and that all government departments are considering pro-poor policies and what that means for different government departments. So policy coherence for us is also a, a really important thing. Uh, first, I'd like to thank um, the committee for its invitation for, to, uh, to give evidence. Um, we're a young organisation with diverse membership across Scotland and Africa, and the majority of our members are under the age of 24 and do not often get a um, seat at the table. So we appreciate the committee's efforts in widening participation um, and to include voices like ours. Um, so my colleagues here have um, given um, examples of how it's worked, uh, how they're able to give a much more broader um, idea of how it works, but I could give you examples of how it works for smaller organisations. Um, so small organisations provide great value for money. For um, example, First Aid Africa has projects where we can train and equip local partners uh, as first responders under £10 per head. However, there is a limit to how much we can scale this up and monitor and evaluate outcomes at the same time without additional staff capacity. This is the same for many innovative Scottish organisations where the barrier to scale is staff time. Um, our colleagues at the Turing Trust also backed us up. We had conversations with them as well. And um, we're well networked within the sector of a small organisation, international organisations. And this is a challenge that permeates civil society groups at our level. Thank you very much. I would, I would um, concur with uh, pretty much everything that's been said by my colleagues. I think this is going to be the problem of being the last person uh, speaking. So I, 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 won't, I won't simply reiterate um, what others have said. Um, but we're also very encouraged by the, the language of the, um, of the statement, the, the emphasis on um, Scotland's role as a good global citizen, I, I think be, being particularly important around some of the uh, discussions uh, about Brexit, which has le led to a lot of... Um, um, sort of in, in, in instability in the minds of, of, of staff and students not feeling co confident in their in their role. So, so that's a, a positive image for uh, for Scotland on the on the global stage. Um, we are particularly um, encouraged by the, the the language of partnership and capacity strengthening. Um, and as others have said, there, there are challenges with engaging Scottish civil society. Um, but there's other challenges to ensure that uh, the voice of our partners really does come through in the partnership to ensure that um, policies are developed uh, collaboratively bet between um, partners in the, in the South and, our and ourselves. Thank you very much. And I should say, um, uh, in response to Professor Sharp, that this was a general question, so you all had an opportunity to answer, but you don't have to do that for every single question. Uh, you can come in as, as and when. Um, can I just ask um, NIDOS and the Scottish Malawi Partnership, I know that you are 
co-funded by the Scottish Government and you mentioned yourself obviously the, the squeeze on public finances at the moment and the need to diversify. Are you able to give us any indication as to how you've been meeting that challenge of um, diversification of your income? Uh, it's not easy, partly because if um, uh, you don't want to cut across your own membership in your fundraising, uh, then the, uh, you know, the raft of charitable trusts and foundations or private fundraising that you can do always have to answer that question, am I taking money from my own membership? Uh, the strategy which we're now taking is to prioritise increasing our membership and our membership fee income. <laughs> Uh, and it's that is that will be for us the number one source. Uh, we think that what we actually deliver through being successful as an organisation is greater opportunity for networking, which Hina mentioned, connectivity, working with universities, working across all the sectors. So if we're successful in doing that, we will not only diversify our income, but by definition, at the same time, get far better at what we're doing and add more value through our work to the international development sector in Scotland. Uh, what uh, uh, NIDOS does with Scottish Government funding uh, is primarily its effectiveness and learning programme. So therefore, for organisations like uh, First Aid Africa, uh, the support that we can actually give in their own organisational development and capacity building is, is key to the, to the outcomes, to the success, which is kind of cross-cutting, uh, helping the sector uh, develop and do better to, to exercise, to practice good practice development. So therefore we feel we shouldn't really charge people to take part in the services because we're co-funded to, co to do it. So the Scottish Government has enabled uh, these services to improve the performance of the sector. But we're moving, as I think I put in my briefing, to become an alliance, uh, Scotland's International Development Alliance, which will open up uh, the opportunities for people from universities, companies, uh, and other sectors involved with international development to join us, which uh, hopefully will not only help us do the job better, but also bring in extra sources of non-governmental income for us. Thank you. David. Thank you for the, for the question. I'm keen to preface my answer by reiterating the very good points that Jane made about the impact of uh, those three core funded networks. There's the Scotland Malawi Partnership, NIDOS, um, the Scottish Fair Trade Forum, but also other key networks like um, Ideas and SCVO. And I think it's a great strength of the sector in Scotland, how the impact that these networks have, but also how well these networks work together. From our own perspective, we know from our research, or in fact, the University of Edinburgh's research, that for each pound put into the, the Scotland-Malawi partnership, it supports 180 pounds coming from Scottish civic society. Now, that's a return on investment that would be enviable for funders anywhere in the world, and that is in part because of the, the sheer number of Scots involved in some way with civic links with Malawi. Separate research suggested that 46% of Scots could name a friend or family member with a connection to Malawi. Working with and through networks unleashes a powerful multiplier effect. The Scottish Government on its own, £10 million a year, would have comparatively modest impact in its international development work unless it worked collaboratively, cooperatively with civic society. And we think networks are an excellent conduit for that. But in specific answer to your question, we are funded with taxpayers' money and it's entirely right that we're accountable and entirely transparent about where that money goes and also that we look to reduce that commitment each year from the Scottish Government. So we are actively working, as NIDOS and the other networks are, to diversify our income. Similar modalities, as Jane mentioned, uh, increasing our membership fees, um, looking at sponsorship, corporate partnerships, and about half a dozen or so other different modalities for bringing in income. But there is a, a critical point here, and that is how do we do that in a way that is scalable and sustainable without underpinning undermining the very values that have made it so successful. We have 237 Scottish primary and secondary schools engaged with Malawi and a part of our network. It would be very sad if we hiked up membership fees such that that reduced to eight or nine private schools uh, alone. So it's keeping the, the values, the breadth, the diversity while acting innovatively to diversify income. Thank you very much. I'll now pass on to um, uh, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. And, uh there's a lot in the strategy that I think has very broad support. That's certainly, uh, I think, the case among uh, members of Parliament, and clearly it's the case from 
the evidence you've, you've, you've given thus far. So, so some of the questions, I guess, are around the practicalities of how that is actually delivered. And I know from the submissions that we received, there were some issues around the way in which uh, that funding is provided. Uh, uh, I know Hina may want to comment on the gap between small grant funding for small organisations and mainstream development assistance for, large, for, for, for well established projects and, 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 and how that gap might be bridged. I'd be very interested in that. And also, I think uh, it'd be interesting to hear a little more from Skiaf about the question of ensuring that funding is predictable and well managed and ensuring uh, that it's always held to the same standards of accountability and transparency. So I wonder if I could ask Hina and Geraldine to start on those points. Okay, absolutely. Um, so currently, um, as we've highlighted in the notes, um, the Small Grants Programme supports organisations with a, with a specific turnover and um, small grants up to uh, 20,000 per year on new innovative projects. Um, so within the um, development assisting funding stream, the government could bridge the gap between successful small grant recipients and um, the main development programme by allowing assessors flexibility on guidance uh, around turnover and Scottish overheads. Alongside bridging that gap um, to create clear pathways for scaling innovative, sorry, I guess I struggle with that word, um, Scottish development programme projects, the government could fund network organisations such as NIDOS and Scotland Live Partnership to support char uh, charities or partnerships following this pathway. Um, apologies, I'll just keep my notes together. Um, so um, direct funding through um, small, small grant funds, which has been beneficial for many small organisations that we've been in touch with, it would be easy to lose this focus if the geographic focus was reduced. We would support broadening the geographic reach of the small grants. However, we understand that as it's not a devolved issue, um, the need to focus on four countries um, at the moment was what works. So um, I'll just pass it on to if there's any other points to be made there. Okay. Thanks. Um, so in our written submission, we made the point about the need for predictable funding um, and funding models. I think the trialling of new models has been in response to some of the consultation that happened prior to the strategy. Um, and that has meant that some funding opportunities are more predictable now. But for most of the large grant funds announced to date on Zambia, Rwanda and Malawi, and also in the Climate Challenge Programme in Malawi, it looks like there's only going to be one funding opportunity every three or four years, and that's pretty limited. Um, so in the whole, I think we welcome innovation, but we would also like to see new models of funding developed and discussed with Scottish agencies before they're trialled. So we recently had the experience of bidding for the Climate Challenge Programme Fund for Malawi. And frankly, it was, we, we felt it was a bit confused and, and rushed. Um, five weeks, there was only five weeks between the invitation to tender and the deadline for submitting the bids. And it was unclear whether the tender was going to be for a fund manager. And so questions were submitted, but they were only, the answers to the questions only came in just over two weeks before the bids were due in, and that's very, very limited time to do all the consultation that you need to do with your partners overseas, and you're implementing um, partners. So we just, we, we felt that that didn't work really that well. Um, there's also, I think, maybe a question around the increasing use of um, fund managers to manage the different rounds. So for Zambia and Rwanda, and also the Climate Innovation Fund, I think my question around about that would be, and the expense of using um, external contractors and whether that's coming directly from the development spend. I think that's um, a point. And then the other thing that we talked about in the written submission was the split between um, development assistance, capacity strengthening and investment. So private sector investment is going to be around about 5% of the spend. So I think we would just be keen to understand a bit better how money designated for investment is going to be used and who will determine objectives and activities around about that and just urging that everybody who receives money um, would be held to the same standards of transparency and accountability. Uh, and do you have a view, when you talk about some of the difficulties with some of the funding streams, do you have, do you have a view as to why that is? Is that because they're, or is it, is there, is it partly because they're um, being managed by 
external contractors, or is it to do I with... I don't know the answer to that. No indication of that. I mean, I was struck, again, in the evidence from First Aid Africa about the, uh, how satisfied they were, you were, with uh, Lodge TSP Foundation as an administrator of the small grants, uh, but clearly your experience in dealing with larger projects is, is not satisfactory. Uh, and I wonder if there's any wider lessons that any of the witnesses would suggest could be drawn um, on, on how the Scottish Government... I mean, I think David's point about this is a, this is a modest sum, it's by definition it's a modest sum, um, and therefore in order to be effective it has to add value. Uh, and I wonder if, if we're hearing different versions as to how effectively value is being added and what might be done about that. I mean, certainly uh, listening to our members, the, the points that um, Hina makes uh, are not in isolation. I think there are a large number of particularly smaller NGOs who have really benefited from the Scottish Government's in innovative small grants programme. And I think that the role and the tone set by the independent grant manager is, is critical to the success of that project, of, of that programme because it needs to be a supportive space. These are smaller organizations, often not used to the, to the language and process and structure of formal applications like this. And I, I absolutely commend the Lloyd, Lloyd's TSB Foundation. Every single applicant who is eligible in this program, it wasn't a contractual requirement, but they picked up the phone and they spent 60 to 90 minutes chatting through with these small NGOs. Well, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? And that, that means that things that could otherwise be insurmountable hurdles because of technical language, because they're not using the, uh, the jargon of the sector, allowed them to choose the very best projects, not just the best presented projects. So I think the role, particularly in the small grants program, um, was critical for Lloyd's TSB Foundation. I think it's, it's, it's really been very, very well run. Um, on that basis, you know, and, and with a very strong positive feedback from our members of the role that they've did, we welcome their involvement um, throughout the program. But I think very good points made there that it is uh, a slightly different constituency, uh, the larger NGOs that are applying for the larger program. Um, but so far, um, it's maybe too early to tell. I haven't seen any evidence uh, that the way they've been managing that has been inappropriate. And really, all I can say is uh, we've been very impressed with the Lloyd's TSB Foundation. But it's also a fair and valid point that making sure that there is uh, an efficient and effective programme and that those grant managers are offering good value for money. But so far, we've had only positive things to say about Lloyd's TSB Foundation. Uh, I would echo the praise that's given to Lloyd's TSB Foundation where the small grant scheme is concerned. Uh, and the feedback we've received, even from the classically unhappy applicant who didn't get uh, on the treatment uh, from Lloyd's TSB Foundation is generally very good. I think where the main grants go, and the Rwanda and Zambia main grant screen, uh, is new. So it's being tried for the first time a new way. Uh, and I've certainly received some negative feedback on the handling of that one, but the extent to which the uh, new scheme is developing, the way it's being rolled out, uh, how much is that of, is in the hands of Lloyd's TSB Foundation and how much they're operating uh, a mechanism uh, that was uh, uh, delivered to them. I wouldn't be entirely sure, but I would just say that uh, I would welcome the fact that the Scottish Government is trying out a new approach to its development assistance with these larger longer term grants. So in terms of the impact that could actually be made in country in Zambia and Rwanda through funding for a much longer period and larger sums of money, uh, it's, it's a good and worthwhile experiment which I think we should all be welcoming. But it then gives Lloyd's TSB Foundation a completely different uh, type of challenge. And I do think that uh, the way some of the partner organizations overseas were expected to develop a concept in a very short space of time has been very challenging, but perhaps lessons can be quite usefully learned for another time, so we can learn as we go along and for it to get better. But I would also want to support Tina's point that there is a gap in the middle in, I think, what are some of the most interesting and useful international development organisations in Scotland. It's, if you like, the graduates of the small grant schemes the organisations who have grown and developed and becoming really useful in the long-term sustainable development outcomes they're achieving overseas, but they're not yet big enough 
to reach up to the Scottish Government's main grant schemes or other funders like DFID. And I would hope that maybe as the new Malawi programme is developed, uh, that there won't be the same gap left so that it's only the larger organisations who are able to apply and the kind of uh, uh, smaller ones who have done well in the small, small grant scheme won't be able to reach up that far. Could I just, just, just echo that, that, the point of the, the necessity of having um, the range of size of, of grants if we really are emphasising the importance of, of partnership to be able to demonstrate um, and to build genuine partnerships it takes a long time and, and, and may have to start in a, in a relatively small scale. And, and so it's really important that there is support at each of these scales to build up for these uh, longer term projects that really can make a difference, but they have to be built upon um, developing those relationships of trust over time. Okay. Right. Um, Margaret Mitchell. Can I thank the witnesses for the written submissions, but it would be good to get on record some of the, the projects that you have been funded for and to, to tell the committee about the outcomes. Um, so over the past few years we received funds for a feasibility study, a capacity building grant and a project grant. In total we've received just over £60,000 in funding. With, this, with these funds we've provided access to locally sustainable first aid resources for over 10,000 people. We have developed online learning resources, reached remote communities where access to pre-hospital care is lacking and worked with local partners to save lives in communities across East Africa. In terms of sustainability, this fund, funding has helped us to build our capacity and the capacity of our partners. For example, in Tanzania, we use some of the funds to launch a training initiative for local companies, which raised over £5,000 in local revenue in the last six months alone. These funds can then be used to provide free and low cost training to low income communities in more remote areas of the country, creating sustainable local funding streams, which does not require Western handouts. Our restlessness and the restlessness of other organisations like ours in the sector comes from the fact that we know we can do more. Because of small grants, because of the small grants programme, we're a better organisation and our partners are thriving. We are now working on a motorbike ambulance project that will provide access to emergency response vehicles to communities across northern highlands of Tanzania. Over the years, SCIAF has received considerable sums of money um, from the Development Fund, particularly for food and nutritional security of small-scale farmers. Um, the Kalima grant was for that, so we had the Zambia part of the work funded by the Scottish Government and SCIAF co-funded, cost-shared with Burundi and Malawi. Um, and I think in that programme, the techniques which were being learned for sustainable agriculture were really key. There was really good exchanges going on between the countries and the learning was coming out. Um, about minimum tillage, mulching, these kind of these techniques that are used in sustainable agriculture. And in fact, those techniques we are now promoting in other countries, in other parts of the world. So there's been really, really good learning from um, the work that's funded. Um, and SCIAF has also received considerable funds from the Climate Justice Fund for water, um, in water projects in Rwanda. Um, and then also match funding for food crisis appeals um, and various other things. So we, you know, we would have absolutely no complaints. We've we've received um, considerable support, and there's been great lessons learned from the work that's been funded. No problem. Yeah. I mean, slightly different for us because we're a, a network rather than an operational um, project. But maybe a few headlines from our perspective over the last couple of years or so. Um, one of the new pieces of work we've been involved in is supporting business, trade, investment and tourism with Malawi. Malawi um, needs a sustainable uh, economy if it is to develop. We've been building Scottish markets for 15 uh, Malawian uh, exports and encouraging Scots to, uh, to holiday in Malawi. 
on youth in schools. Uh, we run an annual uh, youth uh, congress. I was very pleased to, to, to welcome uh, Ross Greer speaking at our last one, which brought together more than 400 Scottish young people from over 20 different schools, the length and breadth of the country, to celebrate and share about their links with Malawi. On the media over the last three years, we've had more than 500 pieces about Malawi in the Scottish media, with around 95% positive in tone. Much of what we work to do is to change the narrative when it comes to international development and the relationship with Malawi, to move away from a narrative of pity to one of partnership, away from sympathy to solidarity. And we work to coordinate Scotland's links. We have various national forums, including in health, primary and secondary education, further and higher education. We support the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, and it was a great pleasure to be in this parliament three weeks ago uh, for the week inviting MSPs to come to our SDGs exhibit, which showed um, examples of Scotland-Malawi cooperation in all 17 of these goals, and more than 100 of this parliament's 129 parliamentarians recorded individual videos championing one SDG. And then finally to note, the Scottish Government also funds our sister network in Malawi, the Malawi-Scotland Partnership, that is Malawian-owned and Malawian-led. I only ever go to Malawi at the invitation as a guest of my colleagues and counterparts in Malawi, and I think that's a real strength of the uh, Scottish Government's far-sighted approach and its commitment to this sense of dignified partnership. I think particularly this GIAF um, example is, is the very best practice of how funding was used, the outcomes, not just for that country, but how they can be then repeated in other countries. And I think with these kind of outcomes, then um, the, the likelihood of gaining funding in the future becomes much more uh, a positive project. More to do with effectiveness. Uh, so what we have been able to do over the last three years, we've just come to the end of a three-year funding period and we have an evaluation report available on our website. So if anybody would like to, to look at it, we had an external evaluation commissioned. Uh, but it's mentoring schemes, one-to-one uh, -one mentoring is available. We have uh, increased the readership of a monthly newsletter to about 2,500 readers now uh, uh, who are able to see what the prime... Uh, concerns are of the international development community in Scotland. Uh, the we have training events and organisational development events. We have a website which people can use for their own effectiveness toolkit, it's called, to improve their own organisational development. In the last year of our three-year funding period from the Scottish Government, we, we received about £125,000. Uh, that's been increased for us now in the new funding, new three-year funding period, which has just started. And uh, the piece of Scottish Government funding, which we are most uh, pleased with and grateful for in the new year going ahead, is the investment on a complete overhaul of the website, which is coming shortly. And the improved functionality is to allow uh, organisations from all the way around Scotland, from uh, the outer isles down to the depths of the borders, to be able to use online training resources and online connectivity in a way that hasn't so far been possible. So that, that for us is a, a key development in getting more people able to participate over the next few years ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Kim uh, Just um, one point. Um, Geraldine Hill, you just spoke a moment ago uh, regarding the, the, the farming aspects. Have uh, SCIAF um, worked with or managed to uh, engage with any, uh, any of the farmers in Scotland or the NFUS um, to assist with any of the projects that you're involved with elsewhere? No, um, we haven't done that to the best of my knowledge, but I was just going to come in in response to um, something that Margaret said, which was that we have developed promising practices which capture the learning from each of these projects. So if anyone's interested in the key learnings that have come out of the work that's been funded by the Scottish Government, we have a series of promising practices and we can certainly share them with people. Okay. Um, a point that was raised earlier on <coughs> was regarding the duplication and uh, networks. And uh, I'm really I'm keen just to, to establish uh, fully how you actually work with other core funded uh, organisations to actually avoid uh, any duplication of work and the, I mean, such as the, the work with the, the Scottish Fair Trade Forum uh, to help them promote the buying of Malawian products. 
If I may, just a, a comment with regard to your last question as well. Um, the Scotland's Rural College in Dumfrieshire is very actively involved with its own links with Malawi, and so there are strong systems to, to harness the expertise in, in Scotland and really strong two-way sharing in, in that regard. Also, the uh, Rural uh, Agricultural Commonwealth uh, Society based here in, in Edinburgh is an active member of the network as well. But in regards to your, your, your current question, yet yeah, there are very strong structures and systems to be able to uh, network well together. So. Uh, Jane, myself and uh, Martin, not with us uh, this morning, the Chief Exec of the uh, Scottish Fair Trade Forum, work very closely together. We meet probably every couple of months or so formally in a cross-network forum meeting. That we use those opportunities to share everything that we're doing strategically going forwards. We regularly map out um, thematically what we're doing and we identify through that mapping process the uh, synergies, I would say synergies rather than overlaps. And in those areas particularly, we have strong commitments to working together in that space. I think all of the, the networks here would, would very much say we are stronger when we work together um, and that it is in no one's interest to duplicate what each other is doing, each other is doing. So I'd say there's very strong systems there. But I would also say that each of us uh, exists independently to represent our own uh, constituencies, our own membership. So one of the things that we do is map uh, our own membership. And actually the proportion of overlap is comparatively very small compared to the whole overall. Um, and that's why you have different networks. But we do work very well together. And happy to give, I think in our last core funding application to the Scottish Government, we gave something like 30 or 40 examples, even within the last year or so of collaborative working between the networks. So very happy to share written case studies to, uh, to evidence that. Can that be helpful? Just to very again, um, um, just to say that we do, in the Klima project um, for Zambia and Malawi and Burundi, we did collaborate with Aberdeen University, so there were, with agriculturalists there who were working on, particularly on soil analysis, and that was helping the programme um, to do its monitoring and evaluation. Um, just to say briefly, so the Ideas Network doesn't get core funding, um, but part of our network um, are the um, six development education centres that cover all local authorities across Scotland, um, and they have core funding that um, part of it comes from international development, the, the bulk of it comes from education. Um, so it, it's just really in terms of the, how they work together. Again, there's very strong um, supportive engagement between development education centres and uh, Scotland Malawi Partnership and Fair Trade Forum. And again, it, it, it enables um, people to focus on their, their, their core work, uh, but also it means that the, um, as David said, the, the, the core work of the other networks, um, we can access that understanding quite easily without having to, to um, work under our own limited capacity, because obviously we, we all work under limited capacity, but uh, I think it's a real strength of the network. It's not just that they're there, but the way that we interact is um, of, of mutual benefit and, and adds value definitely to the, the core funding that, that does go to the various organisations. Well, I think it extends reach. It adds value. Uh, they're all needed. NIDOS. Uh, is there to promote and support international development. So that's its distinct mission. That's what it's there for. Uh, international development across the piece. So we have uh, members who are working in Central Asia or the Philippines. Uh, and we will do everything we can to support them. The work that we do on things like uh, uh, supporting the Scottish Government Small Grant Scheme, uh, it's for organisations who may be working in Malawi or who, who may not. They may be working in other countries. But because we collaborate with the Scotland-Malawi partnership, uh, we can extend the reach into uh, their networks and make sure that more people get the chance to participate in small grants training and support, which we at NIDOS might be doing as more of our core business because uh, we are there to improve effectiveness. So it's, uh, it works well. I think it adds rather than detracts value. And we're all too busy, and our members would not anyway allow us to get away with uh, seeing duplication of effort. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. It's not, um, uh, it, it's not to us something that we struggle with. But that joint working, which is a, a strong part of our uh, ongoing existence, uh, makes sure that it does work well. 
We see ourselves at the Global Development Academy as being very fortunate to be part of these networks and adding in in terms of <clears throat> drawing together best practices in international development, in project management, and in assessment of uh, outcomes and impact. <clears throat> but we also feel like we can play a useful role and have played a useful role in terms of um, generating new thinking through our research on international development that we do in partnership with organisations in Scotland and also in uh, across Africa and um, Asia. Um, so uh, we see we see ourselves as very fortunate as being in this position to be able to draw from uh, other organisations within the network, but also adding in a unique perspective on what's new out there and and what could be um, adapted today. Uh, yes. Yeah, so just in relation to the sustainable development goals, um, the uh, I think the importance of the networks is kind of multiplied by that because it's such a broad-ranging um, set of goals. <laughs> Um, and uh, obviously the crucial distinction between them and the Millennium Development Goals is that they apply domestically as, as well and um, David's flagged up that, that we're now um, kind of building um, links and joint working with SCVO very much to, to ensure that, that, the, that we're joined up with the domestic agenda and I think while there has been kind of top level commitment to the SDGs, I think going forward over this period and, and hopefully with the support of the, the committee that, that really needs to be um, brought down into, into uh, concrete action and, and um, articulated more clearly the, the actions that are going to be taken on, under that and the, the, the networks are absolutely crucial to uh, enabling that to happen I believe. So, sorry, were you not finished? No, I've got more. Well, wait, if it, well, we don't have a great deal of time, mm. so if it could be as um, sure. short as okay. possible in terms of questions and uh, answers. Well, I'll, just, uh, I'll, I'll target it towards uh, Mr Hope Jones. Uh, then it's uh, regard, uh, My constituency of Greenwich and Brookline obviously has links uh, with the uh, Scotland-Malawi partnership, and there's also uh, links with uh, Rwanda, uh, with the Aid for Education uh, charity. Um, how do you um, see uh, your organisation uh, actually uh, trying to increase uh, the awareness of what you're trying to do uh, and uh, to try to get m more people to fully understand uh, the actions that you're undertaking, but also to help try to combat that other uh, situation of uh, some aspects of the media um, not wanting to uh, fully promote the positives uh, of, what, uh, of the actions that you're undertaking? I'll be brief because I know time is short. Firstly, um, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of links in your constituency, in every single constituency in Scotland. On the Rwanda point, we work very closely with the networks for Rwanda and Zambia as well. In fact, this evening I'll be chairing a meeting where we're specifically supporting the capacity building of those, of those networks as well. And I think a good uh, example of networks working well uh, in the sector. On your point on media, on uh, how do we combat the negative narrative in, I emphasize, some sections of, of the media. For me, three points I'd like to raise. Firstly, um, engaging and celebrating community involvement. The, the great thing about Scotland's international development effort, um, and this is no criticism of government, but it is driven by civic society. It is hundreds of churches and hundreds of schools, of hospitals, of universities, of local authorities coming together with one voice and saying we can achieve more through dignified partnership than we can one-way charity. It's very hard for any a tabloid newspaper to be critical of what such a large section of Scottish civic society is doing. The narrative they want to paint is one of top-down, of wastage, of corruption, of uh, dependencies, and that is not what we see in the relationship between Scotland and Malawi and other countries as well. So it's celebrating uh, and recognising the breadth of civic engagement. Um, I think transparency is absolutely keen, uh, key as well, making sure the Scottish Government continues to be absolutely transparent, sharing all information about all projects it funds, but also to do more to celebrate the impact case studies that we're seeing. Edinburgh University estimates that 4 million Malawians benefit each year from those civic links with Malawi, but so too they find a 300,000 Scots. How do we get that narrative out there to show the benefit at both sides and celebrate the civic involvement? Thank you. 
David's uh, point there about um, in the point on engagement uh, within the community. And it's also highlighted in uh, Nairos's uh, brief as well, that more can be done to draw attention to the selfless and praiseworthy efforts of the great number of Scottish citizens who raise funds and attract public attention. As with many organisations in Scotland, volunteers are the backbone of First Aid Africa, and we started with, as an entirely volunteer-led organisation. More and more, we see students rejecting the notion of tokenistic gap year style volunteer and instead wanting to know how they could best contribute to Scotland's international development efforts. They represent a significant and a largely untapped source. Additionally, many older people find that they have time to volunteer after retirement. They have often built up a wealth of knowledge over their careers and their experience should be recognised as a resource it is. But regardless of their age, their uh, gender or race, we would welcome efforts from the Scottish Government to highlight the unsung heroes and heroines of our sector. To do this, it is important to support a wider demographic. Civil society represents a significant section of Scotland's international development offering. From churches and mosques, schools and hospitals, much of the strength of the development sector in Scotland exists outside rooms like this one. If this strength is harnessed, we'll be, we'll, we will have a united voice to push back against this tabloid rhetoric that says development money is wasting money. So most importantly, our country will be able to take pride in the fact that we demonstrate our strength, not through aggression, but through our compassion. Thank you very much. Ross Greer. Uh, can we hear two relatively brief questions, and, and Hina touched on it just in that last comment there, the first one. Um, we sometimes get comments that even in rooms like this, and we are having the discussion about international development and Scotland's links with the rest of the world, that it is the usual suspects. And you actually covered it in your opening statement as well and in your written evidence, First Aid Africa thanks the committee for, for inviting you. Um, and we're very happy to do that. But we as a committee obviously only do this every so often. We have a very broad remit. How do we expand this conversation beyond the usual suspects, beyond the big players, because we spent a substantial part of the first bit of this morning praising the small grants scheme and success of it. How do we involve the people getting those small grants more in this level of the conversation, not just the usual suspects? Uh, I think a new initiative that's come uh, possibly out of the cross-party group uh, and Lewis has been, uh, wrote to the minister, to Dr. Allen recently, to suggest setting up a series of, uh, I think, quarterly roundtable meetings where we could bring uh, more people from the international development sector together. Uh, again, not only uh, the international development organisations, maybe also the universities, businesses and all sorts, but uh, uh, that sounds to me like exactly the kind of forum where not just... Uh, uh, the larger, but also the smaller or non-traditional or volunteer-led uh, organisations can come to the table and can come and share with uh, 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 at ministerial level and with the committees uh, what their work is and so have a better opportunity to describe who they are and the place that they play, both here in Scotland and in uh, global citizenship. So that's not the be-all and end-all, but it's an extremely good way to start. Uh, we at NIDOS have also been trying to work up a proposal whereby we could find a way of uh, 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 funding a piece of work which was media uh, communications work but on the front foot to be proactive rather than reactive in case of yet another piece of strident attack from the right-wing media, whereby we could offer our members, particularly the smaller ones, a way of going out and telling their perhaps local media, perhaps the weekly free sheet about successes that they've had in raising money or delivering programs overseas so that you could have a kind of an ongoing drip, drip, drip led through the members, through the smaller civil society organisations, engagement with their local media about what they're actually achieving. So that still remains on the wish list, but it's something that we at NIDOS would very much like to see become a reality soon. It goes back to the point that um, public understanding and engagement should be an integral part of international development strategy. Um, you know, I, th I think there are nods to it, but but it really needs that that needs to be um, 
you know, formally art articulated better because uh, it really goes hand in order to, to continue and build the support for international development, it needs to be under understood better. People need to be more aware of um, the, the projects and, and initiatives that, that Scotland are involved in. And, and there will, you know, well, if, if with the SDGs, it offers such an important opportunity to do that. And in the new strategy, which I think, you know, we all welcome, two of the priorities are uh, enhance our global citizenship by inspiring communities and young people to realise their role as global citizens and engage the people of Scotland to build on um, Scotland's history as an outward facing country. The, these are two priorities and this is the time to move beyond that and, and actually lay out how, how that's, that's going to be done. Um, in in uh, the European Union, there are very strong statements about the development, about development education and awareness raising. And in many European countries, it's, um, you know, it's uh, uh, just in terms of funding as well, it's, uh, uh, it's a designated part of, of the, the funding programme. I think it's, it's absolutely crucial that we, that we use this period, the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, to ensure that public engagement and understanding is developed. And, and as I said at the beginning, global citizenship education is a means of ensuring this is done, not as um, just informing people of information, but engaging um, people with that process because they, they are, I mean, we're all aware of the, the, the changes that have happened over the, you know, the, the, the past few years that, the, that are difficult to explain. They, they, they need concentrated engagement. They can't be, you know, the, the tabloid press will give, give one line. It, it's, uh, it requires a process of education to uh, develop understanding of what international well, it means to us all, and I, I think one of the, the quotes we often use is that the, this understanding um, that this is not about charity, um, so the quote is really that um, there are chains of cause and effect that prompt obligations of justice, you know, not pity and charity. Um, you know, the, this is the opportunity that, that we have in this, the scale of, of Scotland and with the, the players that are in place to, to really build on that under the framework of the sustainable development goals and through policy coherence for development. Sorry, I went on a bit. <laughs> Sorry, was there... Just if, if we've got time, yes, course, yes. my second yeah, question yeah. was going to be on global citizenship education. So Tanya's led very neatly into that. Um, I mean, I've had some experience of seeing that the kind of schools in Scotland that are engaged with this through the Malawi partnership and really brilliant work going on, which is how I actually met First Aid Africa for the first time. But it's still, it's not everyone. So I was wondering if you're able to, to outline uh, what the barriers are for engaging more schools. Are are there schools from particular socioeconomic backgrounds in general that are the ones that do find it harder to engage? Are, are there patterns there? What are the barriers to us really expanding this so that every young person in Scotland is not just getting global citizenship education through the curriculum, but has the potential for direct experience through, through project work? Um, well, we, uh, I think in the written evidence, so ideas members have worked with um, around five, 6,000 teachers over the, the past few years and uh, about 1,500 schools. So it is something that we're building and within education there is the policy context for it. Um, I think in, in terms of, it, it's just really sus sustaining that and understanding that, um, that uh, education um, is, uh, much more than around literacy and numeracy. We have, the, we have a, a, a very strong commitment to global citizenship throughout the policy context in Scotland, but it's just ensuring that that's uh, delivered. In terms of the socioeconomic um, uh, factors in the schools that engage, I don't think that is a case because um, we, one of the key things about global citizenship education is that it, it really reinforces pupil engagement um, so that actually it can have the most um, kind of traction, if you like, where uh, there may be uh, disengaged pupils who don't feel that, that they're, they're getting what they want out, out of education. So it can really pull in across, across the board. 
Um, I think what I would encourage all members of the committee to do is to um, go and visit their local development education centre. Um, so, as I say, there are six of these across Scotland and they cover all local authorities and it's really the best way of understanding what global citizenship education is. I think I, I put in the, in the written evidence this table, the Oxfam table of what global citizenship education covers and you can see it's a wide range of issues. So really the best way to understand what it means is to go to the development education centres and they will enable you to see what it means in schools. It's absolutely crucial that this is uh, supported and sustained and not lost as a, as a commitment. Um, I highlighted uh, our connections with Europe um, and the work that we've done there. It should be recognised that Scotland really has huge expertise that is, uh, is recognised and respected across Europe in this field and uh, is really something to, to, for, for all that MSPs to engage with. Can I just, um, I'd like to thank you for that question. That is something that um, personally I feel quite um, strongly about. Um, and it's one of the areas where we do believe that some improvement within um, and support within um, members of the black minority ethic um, representation um, could be done better. Um, the fact that the committee would invite a 23-year-old Muslim woman from Dumfries um, to give evidence is humbling. But I also know that many other people who look like me or share my faith do not see international development sector as a viable career path. I have been lucky to have role models. At First Aid Africa, the chair of the board when I first volunteered was the feminist leader Talat Yacoub. Equally, I could point to Hamza Youssef to counter a comment that was kind of a common argument within my community that international development was white people's work. On top of this, the charity has taken simple but effective steps like giving guidance to our Muslim first aid instructors on volunteering during the holy month of Ramadan. Last year, First Aid Africa volunteers represented half of all Scottish universities and came from across the country, from Stirling to Shetland. Among them were Sikhs, Christians, Buddhists, Muslims, atheists, etc. Yet, across the sector, only 2% of formal volunteers are non-white. This is clearly, there is clearly more the sector can do to remove those structural boundaries that exist in participation from non-white Scots. Money donated to charity by British Muslims during Ramadan was 10 times the Scottish Government's yearly international development budget. Funds sent to the Global South by diaspora communities dwarf all government spending on international development. We suggest it will be important for us to acknowledge this contribution as, as the international development strategy is implemented. Scotland welcomes the world and it's something that we should be so proud of. There's more that we can do to engage this, the diaspora and BME groups. The stronger our international development sector will be. A couple of the statements that were made earlier. I mean, one of the points I was going to touch on was raised by Stuart McMillan in, in relation to the and to the media and what you think could be done there. Um, but it's just you talked about. Uh uh, Dr. Weisel in particular, about the strong statements from the EU in terms of the sustainable development goals. Now, is that something that you think needs to be given uh, almost a higher priority here and more focus here as well? And I also was looking to tease out um, some of the, the links that each of you have across the EU as well. We've talked a bit about Brexit and the potential impact and um, and I think in initially in your initial comments, um, Jane, you talked about the how that's putting a squeeze on individuals and in their and their own ability to be able to you know, personally donate, but just if there's wider funding implications for you as part of that as well. Just on a very specific point around funding, so um, in the written evidence, we uh, there's a funding stream called Development Education and Awareness Raising, the Deer Deer funding. Um, and uh, in the previous funding round, Ideas uh, and its members secured funding of uh, around £600,000, and the Scottish Government uh, committed co-financing of around £100,000 to that. So um, we've uh, just... Uh, ideas and two of its members have just uh, been part of bids that have been accepted uh, for funding, and we're at that stage between 
you know, the, the, the signing off on it. But um, so there, there is an issue. We will be looking for co-financing for those projects, but it's um, smaller than the previous percentage. Um, so I suppose there's, there's that issue, but there's the wider issue that that uh, certainly, as I mentioned, IDEAS doesn't have core core funding, but uh, we had been developing our engagement with this fund, um, and actually the last time we spoke to the committee in the previous parliament, um, the, there was a, a strategic engagement where, whereby a government, if focused on these streams, can actually build the, the, the money that, that comes through them. So obviously that's a serious implication for us um, if that is lost, although uh, uh, I think, I know you the committee is working on this this anyway, but the the continuing engagement uh, post Brexit or um, with with the EU is obviously something that's really important across international um, development. So um, yes, that's that's probably uh, you know that's our kind of specific point in in relation to to Europe. But again, as I mentioned before, that we have this expertise that is in global citizenship education that is important in Europe and I've highlighted a global education intergovernmental network that I would really encourage uh, and really hope that uh, Scottish Government might en engage with over this period because whatever happens, the importance is to maintain uh, and strengthen links um, with, with other European countries on issues like this which are necessarily global. On uh, uh, private charitable giving and disposable income, uh, that's more of a fear on uh, what will happen if disposable income shrinks than what's going to happen to uh, the capacity to give money. But uh, I would just quickly like to draw attention to the fact of um, engagement. Back to the question of the, uh, the media and uh, public engagement with international development. Uh, if it was possible to act proactively to work on uh, building relationships with the media so that international development is understood and warmly supported in Scotland and what Scotland civil society organisations do, uh, then that affects the operating environment within which the smallest charity can go out and uh, fundraise in the, you know, the car boot sale on a Sunday. You need ordinary people to feel receptive towards international development uh, as part of uh, creating the atmosphere within which uh, private individual donations can be, can be made. So there's a link there between engagement, supporting engagement, and uh, creating the atmosphere for private charitable giving. Uh, quickly, just very quickly on, the, on uh, Europe and Brexit, uh, some of the larger organisations will be directly affected uh, if they can no longer bid for, win, and implement uh, European-funded programmes. So we watch with great interest what's going to happen to, say, the European Development Fund. And the, uh, the money, I think it's 1.2 million a year that goes... Uh, 1.2 billion a year that goes from the UK into the European Development Fund. What's going to happen to that money after Brexit? But on a more uh, uh, philosophical point, even uh, without the hard financial... Uh, loss that comes out of Brexit. It's back to global citizenship and how we feel about the people of different nationalities who live amongst us. So therefore for us in the international development community uh, to live with the threat of uh, uh, EC nationals losing their citizenship in this country, it's uh, abhorrent to, uh, to most of us in our sector. So there's that philosophical uh, 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 fear or threat or damage that goes beyond the, uh, the hard financial threat. Thanks. Um, yeah, just to add on, on some of the funding issues, we do receive a considerable amount of money from EU through co-funding. Um, I don't know the exact figure, so I'm not going to give you the exact figure, but um, we are, we, you know, that will be a loss of, of a funding stream for us. And a, a point about that is that through the EU, we've had funding for working countries which no one else will fund anymore, particularly in Latin America. So considerable funds for Colombia and also Central America, which just no one else is funding now. So that is that is going to be a big impact for us. And I suppose as well, just this, the whole thing about when, um, when funding rounds are open now, we just fear that they just won't even consider um, bids and applications that are coming from the UK because... What's 
So yeah, it's, it's having implications. Your question was the sustainable development goals, um, if I may, on, on that. Now, civic society, academia, business have very key roles, and I'm very happy to talk through that if that's useful. But if I may, um, to start with uh, the government and, and parliament's role, um, absolutely delighted that the sustainable development goals were visible both in the consultation behind um, this policy and in, in the policy itself, indeed, on its, on its front cover. Um, I think the headline, the tone, the language is all very encouraging, but there is a need for more detail. There's a need for more detail on, on the exact structures of how Scotland will deliver on these 17 very far-reaching and incredibly ambitious goals. To date, the, the, the main focus has been about mapping across from the national performance framework, how will those achieve the SDGs? Now, that's in, entirely understandable in, in many ways. You don't want to reinvent a completely new uh, delivery infrastructure. But there is a risk that if, if that is the end rather than the beginning, it becomes more about packaging and presentation rather than additionality uh, and, and, and impact. So very much encourage the Scottish Government to continue its genuinely world-leading commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals. We're two years into a 15-year commitment. Um, that's not the beginning anymore. Um, and there's a real need for, for clear um, cross-departmental structures, ideally at, at a cabinet level. The UK Parliament's International Development Committee made some very, very good recommendations in an inquiry uh, about this time last year and, and very much encouraged this committee to look at those and we stand behind them. But also the Parliament, I think, has a key role. Wouldn't it be fantastic if every time an MSP in the Chamber stood up to, to give a, a speech on a specific subject, they were able to preface it by saying, in, in, in uh, keeping with the Scottish Government's, in the Scotland's commitment to SDG, whatever it is, uh, doesn't uh, the Scottish Government feel dot, dot, dot. But also for this Parliament to think about what structures it needs to be able to deliver and hold the government accountable to the delivery of the SDGs? And indeed, what role does this committee have on the SDG? So civic society has a clear role, but so too does, does government and, and parliament. Could, could I just very, very quickly add um, a f further impacts on, um, on, on Brexit? The, clearly, the academic sector, uh, the university sector is... Um, uh, has considerable amounts of, of money from um, from Europe, um, but there's also an impact in terms of of uh, the the highest quality staff not coming to our universities. We've seen people in the last uh, year or so uh, turning down job offers, uh, people who were going to be leading on uh, EU grants being politely asked by their European counterparts to step down so that they can they can lead. It's it's already it's already having impacts on. Um, our, our role in, in, in world-leading research in that respect. So it, it's, not just the it's, it's not just the anticipation of what might happen, it's, it's impacting already. Um, and we have, we have staff members from, from Europe who've, who've lost their security about the future. So it's, um, it, it, it's offering many challenges. Okay, thank you very much. I understand, Lewis MacDonald, you wanted to come back in? Yeah, I just wanted to come back briefly on the development education question and Tanya wisely uh, talked about uh, development education centres and about um, the, the role that they can play. I visited the Montgomery Development Education Centre in Aberdeen last week and um, your, the answer around social economic uh, uh, position was, was reflected there. Uh, the uh, Riverbank Primary School was praised for its particular uh, role in this and, and that's in a, a relatively disadvantaged part of Aberdeen. What I think came up, and there were people there from development education centres around Scotland at, at, at this meeting, was a, a, an issue, I guess, around how you get the very broad buy-in at primary school level through the filter of curriculum for excellence into the same level of engagement uh, at secondary school. And I wonder if, if, if you would want to comment on that or if other witnesses would want to comment on that in terms of how... The, the, the very good basis that's laid early in, in, in the earlier stage of formal education that can be maintained into secondary education. Uh, yes, they, it has always been much more challenging in the, the secondary sector, but um, the certain aspects under Curriculum for Excellence have been really important, that particularly uh, around interdisciplin interdisciplinary learning um, that uh, enables uh, teachers to work across their, their subject areas um, to, to, to build context for learning. And I think this goes back to the, the pupil engagement issue um, 
that attainment is heavily dependent upon pupil engagement. That's one of the, the key drivers um, for for this. So I think that's that that's a, a really important part of it. Um, we uh, have also um, focused on actually one of the other European projects that in the last uh, round of funding, Teach Global Ambassadors was, was really important in this and it highlighted the need for in-depth engagement, so really, um, uh, and also systemic engagement. So that uh, project worked with, um, you know, a fairly limited group of secondary teachers um, it was in conjunction with uh, Lithuania, um, and uh, we worked with the, the teachers across both, both countries to really develop their critical engagement with, um, uh, with global citizenship education. And uh, we also worked with the local authorities, so, so the, the, the teachers were kind of ambassadors to engage with the local authorities, local authority staff were involved with the training as well. And this is really seen as a... a a really strong model for um, building that systemic change so that secondary schools can engage with these issues. Um, just last, the other thing we've, we've looked at is sometimes the, the teachers need the engagement of the young people to um, really, um, in some ways, justify their engagement with this um, area, although it is fully embedded in the teaching standards and it is fully embedded through the curriculum and it is under learning for sustainability and entitlement for all Scottish pupils. So although those are all there, um, teachers, as we know, all, all know, are, are under a lot of pressure. So, um, But the, uh, we had an event on Friday and we have a, a, a few coming up that uh, work directly with young people as kind of advocates around the sustainable development goals. Um, so that's a kind of another strand of engagement. So it's definitely possible in secondary schools. It's always been more challenging. I suppose in relation to the, uh, the how to sustain this, which is uh, Ross's point, um, the, I should probably say we have had funding streams through DFID historically, but as, as you're probably aware, um, Everything in DFID is really under review at, at the moment, so it's, it's not clear what's happening there. As I said, we're, we're losing the um, potential loss of the, the EU funding stream, so this will be potentially an issue to, to come back to the committee with how, how this work is, is sustained. If I could also just come in on that quickly. Um, we have a number of undergraduate courses, um, for example, Africa in the Contemporary World that is available for first and second year undergraduates and one on international development as well. And we really notice that um, undergraduates from across the university take these courses and are really keen to take it. But it is a comment that comes up from the students themselves that this is their... Uh, often the first opportunity they've had to engage in uh, these issues and particularly on the Africa in the Contemporary World course where a lot of students um, don't have access to the kind of detailed country level knowledge the, to get an understanding of the variation of across the content uh, co across the continent and um, great comments from uh, young people from the di African country diasporas who are saying this is the first time they've had courses which have been uh, that talk to their, their experiences of their parents etc. So I think there is a huge demand from um, certainly the uh, young people uh, at the university to, to know more uh, when uh, through the secondary school system about development and about uh, Africa in particular. Um, last night I was at an excellent event with um, Scott Deck and, and Ideas which brought together uh, nursery, primary and secondary teachers to look at what support do they need to be able to uh, advance this agenda, particularly the sustainable development group, uh, goals. And I was facilitating a, a, a workshop there and came up with quite a number of really good bits of, 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 of suggestions and, and evidence from those teachers. Rather than go through it now, I wonder if I could uh, offer that as a supplementary written evidence directly from teachers themselves about what for them would, would, do they need to be able to take this, this forward. Thank you. Well, we're coming to almost the end of our time. The issue of Brexit has been raised by uh, nearly everyone on the panel today. Has any evaluation been made of the impact of Brexit on your sector financially? Work on it. Our sister organisation in London 
uh, and they commissioned some research. Uh, I'm not sure whether or not the findings have been presented yet, but if they haven't, they will be shortly. So I'd be very happy to forward that to, to this committee if you'd be interested to see it. Yeah, I think, I think that would be very useful. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank all our uh, witnesses for coming to give evidence uh, today, and we will now uh, go into private session.